All right, so in my first lecture, I talked about embrainment and you know, how culture may get under the skin in this upper part of your physical body, namely uh, neuroscience and how brain may be affected. Uh, second part, I like to discuss the body, how uh, cultural environment uh, might be links to well, basically well-being uh, of your body, um, mostly focusing on biological molecular well-being. And in the recent years, uh, inspired by the same per guy who <laughs> does this business, my, uh, Steve Cole, uh, well, both Carol and I got into this whole thing almost uh, separately without knowing uh, uh, what, uh, what each other was doing. But that really introduced me into this uh, extremely expanding, interesting, expanding field of research on biological well being. And at the same time, I have been long involved in uh, big survey projects uh, in the United States called uh, Midlife in the United States. And Mayumi Karasawa and I, among several other people, try to duplicate the same survey in Japan. So now it's called Midlife in Japan, Mija. And both surveys um, were very extensive, uh, but very interesting. Now it's longitudinal. But more important, at least uh, to me, we drew blood. So out of blood, uh, you can isolate some pro-inflammatory markers. Uh, one uh, already Carol mentioned, uh, interleukin-6, uh, CRP, uh, C-reactive protein, and so on. So this really opened up uh, a big window uh, uh, into uh, interconnection between biological health uh, and sociocultural variables. So uh, in my second hour, I'd like to give you some preliminary findings from this. So particularly, I'd like to focus on personality and the extent to which different personality traits might be related uh, to biological health. And uh, I'd like to focus on neuroticism and conscientiousness, mainly because those two personality characteristics are the ones that are believed to be highly, highly relevant to health in the con contemporary literature. And, and I'd like to discuss some future prospects. Now, do you recognize that? <laughs> of course. Um, <coughs> she's a Margaret Mead. Uh, and she was uh, one of the founders of the entire field of culture and personality. And back then, uh, their conceptualizing uh, is to postulate, a uh, postulate culture as kind of personality literage. Uh, so basically, there's some kind of isomorphism. Um, so different cultures emphasize extraversion, different cultures may emphasize something else, and so on. And as it turned out, uh, McRae and Costa uh, developed extremely extensive questionnaire to measure uh, those you know, five or so traits which are believed to be cross-culturally common uh, these days. And actually, you can get fairly decent evidence that those five are more or less common. You have to add something. You have to subtract something from time to time. But well, we talked about the cognitive approach just a moment ago uh, toward the end of my talk. Uh, you know, for a long time, I was uh, extremely skeptic about uh, measurement of personality with questionnaires. But now, uh, those measurement appears to work. And given this measurement, um, uh, McRae and Costa have shown that there's a fairly systematic profile of five traits across different cultures. Five traits being, um, what was A? Uh, 
Oh, yeah, of course. Agreeableness, conscientiousness, extra virgin, neuroticism, and openness to change. Okay. Now, what I like to discuss is somewhat different from this. Uh, what I like to discuss is kind of a relationship, correlation, association between those personality traits and health. If you are neurotic, are you unhealthy? Or if you are conscientious, do you go to gym often enough to keep yourself well enough, right? So those are the kind of questions I want to ask. And interesting question is whether expansion of the field of this kind of research cross-culturally uh, may be justified. Or in other words, whatever we know today may depends importantly on the subject populations we typically test, namely Caucasian American, uh, middle class possibly, uh, individuals in many uh, Western countries, including US, Canada, and some uh, Western European countries. So, let me start uh, with neuroticism. Neuroticism uh, is a global, oh, by the way, uh, you know, I'm a social psychologist, and I, I was trained not to believe anything like stable personality trait. Now, given this premise, there's nothing like personality trait, it's very hard to believe that there's any I mean, it seems so ridiculous to use several items to measure anything like this. Now, one thing I learned is that sometimes empathy works. So you try to empathize with or take perspective of folks who really believe that personality exists. And then look at this. Well, this could work. And uh, th th there's been some personal transformation <laughs> in over the last several years. Initially, I was extremely skeptic uh, because I didn't really believe any systematic dispositional differences. But now, after you know, a good number of years, I began to think that there might be something. So. Today, you really have to listen to my talk with this mindset that personality probably would exist. You can challenge that assumption, just to keep it to yourself till the end of my talk. <laughs> and you just, I want you to see what you can see when you start with this kind of premise. You can, you know, you can be skeptical and you can do so, and please do so after having listened to me. All right, so neuroticism is a global trait links to negative affectivity, and this is really consistent uh, the links to uh, bad health, especially when health is measured in self-report indicators. Are you healthy? Well, if you're neurotic, you say no, no. Okay, or major chronic conditions. Why don't you check all the problems that you have? Neurotic people tend to check more. So this kind of evidence is used to show that neuroticism is very bad on your health. Now, interestingly, in the recent years, oh, by the way, um, uh, here's a you know, authoritative review by Friedman. Uh, Howard Friedman is a big name in this field. And he says the following, assumptions that neuroticism leads to disease have existed since ancient medicine with excessive melancholic and phlegmatic humor is believed to cause depression, cancer, rheumatism, fevers, and other disease. Now, I think this belief still exists, and as long as you use self-report, evidence is very solid and strong. However, interestingly, when you use some measure uh, of biological health, uh, like interleukin-6, CRP, evidence become very, very fragile, very fragile. Uh, and that's where we started our investigation. 
And our idea uh, was fairly uh, straightforward. The idea is that, well, sometimes uh, neuroticism uh, should be good. Otherwise, neuroticism must have been eliminated. There must be some adaptive value of some sort. And in fact, you have a wonderful car and you have a wonderful highway like Germans do. Uh, you'd better be a little bit neurotic before driving your car on the wonderful highway, because otherwise uh, you may be killed. And very much likewise, a uh, social world uh, may be a dangerous place. There may be a lot of landmines, and uh, well, some, some degree of anxiety, some degree of cautiousness, some degree of negative orientation m could be extremely adaptive. Now, well, question is exactly when and for what kind of people this adaptiveness of neuroticism may come out. And we propose that something like behavioral adjustment may be very important. By behavioral adjustment, I mean your tendency to flexibly adjust your behavior depending on the environmental contingencies. So. You know, if you are speaking to your professor, you may change your behavior a little bit, even though, you know, you may believe some kind of equality, egalitarianism, but better to be a little polite. Uh, or uh, just a moment you said something, you realize uh, you, you end up saying something you didn't have to say better be careful and so that you can preempt your problem. So neuroticism could be very useful and could potentially be very adaptive as long as you are willing and also capable of making an adjustment. For cultural, social, and possibly dispositional reasons, some people may be unwilling. Uh, that's where uh, our, my talk in the, in the first hour could be relevant because previous research have shown that there's a fairly systematic cross-cultural difference such that this adjustment tendency tend to be higher among Asian folks as compared to Caucasian Americans. Uh, and of course, given what I said in the morning, could be true that uh, rice growing regions might show even greater adjustment, but we don't know. There's no evidence at this point. So, well, we try to measure this behavioral adjustment and see if the correlation between neuroticism by, and biological health may be moderated in some way. And we try to see if this might help us understand any potential cross-cultural variation in the association between neuroticism and biological health. So generally, we believe, literature believes that neuroticism is unhealthy. Evidence is weak. There might be some systematic cultural difference, question one. To the extent that there's a cultural difference, might be the case that behavioral adjustment might have some effects. So, this is our way uh, to measure behavioral adjustment. Uh, so basically, subjects need to respond by agreeing or disagreeing uh, with those items. I usually follow the opinion of people I can respect. Some are social like this. Uh, some others are less social. Uh, once something happened, I try to adjust myself to it because it's difficult to change it myself. It is useless to try to change what's going to happen in life because it's impossible to predict it. So, well, th th these sentences can be interpreted in very different way, but our intent was to measure the extent to which, you know, just forget about what you really want to do. Just try to be flexible, try to adjust to the environmental contingencies. So that was the intent of the scale. Now, how about sample? This is a, 
two samples, uh, one MIDAS sample and two MIJA sample. Uh, this is coming from European Americans, so that's a random sample, uh, random sample. So very tiny proportion of the people are non-European heritage uh, descent people. So to maximize the cultural contrast, we focused on 976 uh, Caucasian Americans. Again, that's uh, based on demographic information. Uh, 382 residents in Tokyo, uh, fairly comparable in terms of age, uh, social class, educational background, proportion of uh, sex, uh, gender, uh, and uh, that's our sample. Uh, as I mentioned to you, we drew blood uh, from uh, the, these groups of people, uh, out of which we extracted uh, some biomarkers, as I mentioned to you. And in this survey, we measured neuroticism uh, just by uh, examining response uh, to characterization of the self in terms of those uh, trait adjectives. So worrying, nervous, moody, and calm. That's reverse coded. Uh, and you can see why you really have to believe that there's a personality. Uh, you, know, you, you just look at this and you are skeptical, skeptical about the presence of personality. You may say, oh my gosh, what is that? Uh, however, as it turned out, data is very, very systematic that makes me feel that there's me something like personality. So out of the blood, we assess interleukin-6, C-reactive protein. Those are the measures of inflammation. Well, inflammation essentially is a neurobiological process that happens primarily in blood vessel initially because those substances need to be transported through blood to where the damage was done. Injury happens, right? Now, when the injury happens for real reason, like knife is hitting your skin, uh, this is very effective and uh, there's an obvious biological adaptation. However, as it turned out, our immune system is set up in such a way that when you anticipate some physical injury, this system gets activated. And even more tragically, we humans seem to have symbolic self as well as physical self, and, and in fact, when there's a prospect of injury to your soul, inflammation system uh, can get activated. So essentially, it's kind of many people, including Steve Cole, have now demonstrated lots of factors of social and personal adversity uh, do activate a series of gene expression that eventually leads to uh, production of those substances which indicate uh, inflammation. Now, inflammation cannot go away because your social threat is with you. So if your boss is horrible, I'm sorry, you have to go back on the next day. So what that means, that inflammation responses which are designed initially to kill external organism, in this case bacteria, can turn on you uh, to begin to cause harm on your system. So clearly, initially, a systemic problem begin to happen in cardiovascular system. That's how inflammation responses are transported. So that's the reason why we measured blood pressure as well as amount, essentially, of bad cholesterol. Uh, so those two are indicators of the health of cardiovascular pro system. Now, uh, this is simply correlations uh, among those uh, four biomarkers. And what's simply interesting uh, is that those uh, measures correlate very well, reasonably well. And if you carry out uh, principal component analysis, uh, there's a single factor. So that summary index I'm going to discuss, but all results I'm going to discuss today happen more or less in each one of those four. Uh, simply results become much more robust if you collapse those four indicators as you might expect. 
So here's the initial result. Uh, this is interesting. Here, this is a factor score uh, of uh, you know uh, extent of uh, inflammation and cardiovascular problem. So uh, higher number is biological health risk. Here we plotted neuroticism. And here, uh, one standard deviation high or low in behavioral adjustment. And what you see is very interestingly, um, here there's a fairly robust correlation such that, uh, uh, in fact, if anything, neuroticism is correlated with reduced biological health risk. So, you know, neurotic people seem to be healthier. Uh, however, for those folks who are relatively low in behavioral adjustment, that effect tend to be reversed. Now, in the meanwhile, there was little cultural difference in neuroticism. However, there's fairly sizable cultural difference in behavioral adjustment so that behavioral adjustment to tend to be higher among Japanese, lower among Americans. Make sense? Now, you combine those two pieces of information, could be the case that neuroticism, neurotic Japanese are healthier, and neurotic Americans are less healthy. Well, you might expect that, and that's, uh, uh, here's the data uh, we got. Here, w I'm showing the data in different way. Here, neuroticism. Here, Japanese. Here, European Americans. MIDA sample. Here, MIDA sample. Uh, among Japanese, if anything, neuroticism is associated with better biological health. Uh, and uh, for among Americans, there was no effect. Now, this group is pretty big, like 1,000 people. And there's massive individual difference, obviously. So some Americans are more like Japanese. Some sizable minority of Americans are really refusing to adjust. You know, I really want to do what I want to. You know, adjusting to the environment, that's no, that, that's not what you want to do. Uh, they are very strong in the belief against adjustment. And if you isolate those individuals, there is fairly strong evidence indicating that neuroticism predict bad health in biological level. Make sense? So what I, yeah, go ahead, please. Because you're adjusting according to standard deviation, and I was wondering whether the groups are actually comparable, or whether they do they overlap? Oh yeah. Or is there actually no overlap in your system? And what's oh, the thing is, you know, like you know what I mean? Like maybe the more neurotic Japanese or not as neurotic as the least neurotic American. And so I was wondering if we're seeing. Well, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't say it. Neuroticism, individual difference is massive. And mean score for the two groups is virtually very similar. So there's tremendous overlap. The same applies to adjustment as well, even though in this case, mean score is substantially higher among Japanese than among Americans. So what that means is that more, relatively more Japanese are represented here. Relatively more Americans are represented here. Okay, and, and by the way, there's massive cultural difference so that Japanese are healthier. Now, of course, this can be anything, right? Maybe bluefish, maybe rice, maybe less butter, maybe less red meat, or maybe something else. We don't know. Uh, but above and beyond it, there's very systematic relations uh, between neuroticism and better health among Japanese group, in part because of this. And among this group, there's no effect. Uh, 
except if you isolate people who are very low in behavioral adjustment, graph goes like this. Is it clear enough? So uh, we are very excited about it because neuroticism usually is believed to be very bad on your health. And well, for one thing, we didn't find much evidence on this except for a fairly sizable, still minority of American folks who are very low in adjustment. For the rest of the people, neuroticism appears to be adaptive, especially among Japanese. Now, here, really, uh, well, right now, this, uh, all this is fairly uh, uh, preliminary, but, uh, well, What was I going to say? Oh yeah, how about subjective health and well-being? Uh, as I mentioned to you, when you test subjective well-being or subjective health, neuroticism is always a big predictor of bad health. Now, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, neuroticism at biological level seems to be a predictor of better health, especially among Japanese. Even among Japanese, Neurotic Japanese are saying that they are not healthy. Why is that? Well, one possibility is simply uh, this could be an artifact of two self-report majors being asked. You know, health is good, neuroticism is bad. So for that reason alone, those two may be correlated negatively. But at the same time, if you really believe that neuroticism is good because you are vigilant of bad things and to the extent that you can handle some threat that you can identify, this can improve your life circumstances. You can avoid landmine. You can avoid some social disaster. You can avoid some traffic accident and so on. And then there might be some real value or some real truth in subjective experience of bad health uh, among neurotic individuals. So, uh, you know, here Confucius saying, our great glory is not, is not in never falling, fa falling, but in rising every time we fall. So falling in, in and by itself is not bad, uh, which I mean metaphorically what neuroticism does, just highlighting threat, highlighting potential problems. As long as you can handle it, neuroticism can eventually lead to better outcome. Yeah, go ahead. What is the age of the, the age of the age of the Mean age is about 55, 57. Uh, age range is like 38 all the way up to 75. Okay, that's something interesting to say actually about that. Because we tested neuroticism uh, with people who Canadians, and we found that that trait correlated with the use of cognitive dependence strategy. So they're using a different system. Japanese who are older, we also test it, they don't use that same brain system. And it can actually help explain some of the results that you're Oh, really? Because it's known that in North America, neuroticism is a predictor amongst amyloid positive individuals which ones are going to get Alzheimer's disease. Our data in aging show that these are the chronic nucleus dependent uh, people, people who are using uh, chronic nucleus dependent strategies. In other words, there's a relationship in North America between neuroticism, cotic nucleus, and then atrophy in the hippocampus, which is a predictor of who's going to get Alzheimer's disease. But that's, that can't be true in older Japanese, because older Japanese, they all use their hippocampus. They don't use their cotic nucleus. Oh, how do you know that all the Japanese use? Uh... Well, we did a study. It was a small oh, sample. Oh, I see. Oh, interesting. We tested interesting. Japanese. We tested Chinese. We get the same effect you, you talked about with the well, young that's Japanese. That's very interesting. Let me Chinese move on and sh share with you some data. I have some brain data, very preliminary. Uh, and here, this is very early study by Brian Knudsen, a neuroscientist. Uh, they did 
this very interesting, very simple-minded research, examining the relationship between neuroticism and brain volume. Uh, and basically, here's a quote from their paper, but essentially, uh, they believe that neuroticism increased stress. Stress produced cortisol. Cortisol destroyed brain. Uh, they didn't quite say it, but essentially, cortisol can degenerate neurons, resulting in smaller brain volume. Now, is there any evidence for it? Here's their data. Um, this is old data, almost uh, 15 years ago. Here, neuroticism, and this is uh, brain ratio, meaning that ratio of gray matter and everything else. So that's what they studied. And there's a systematic decrease of brain volume as a function of neuroticism. Where is that? Which population? Oh, Americans. See, I would not believe that these data would replicate in Japanese because we also have data. I'm going cortisol. to show you. I'm going to show you. you, have, you have oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so now, as, uh, for, yeah. So this is unpublished. Oh, actually, we just submitted this paper uh, yesterday. Uh, if you happen to be a reviewer. <laughs> Here's Japanese data. Look at this. This is neuroticism. And this is the same measure, uh, cortical volume. Neurotic Japanese have bigger brain. And here's, this is uh, uh, Knudsen's data, so just the opposite. Now, Japanese data is not really ultra strong, super strong in this case, because uh, in the brain becomes smaller, unfortunately, as a function of age. As a function of age, neuroticism increase. So you have to control for, well, many confounds, including age. And once you control for them, Japanese effects go away. However, even when you do this, one particular region survives this, you know, surgical <laughs> uh, uh, attack uh, on the robustness of the effects. And that's here. This is a right. Uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, which is associated typically with self-regulation. So at least uh, this is consistent with the idea that uh, new neurotic Japanese recruit some self-regulatory capacities on a daily basis and again and again with the effects on, on some control region of the brain. Now, one more uh, really recent data. Now, MIDAS project has a neuroimaging component uh, so that uh, they have uh, the same structural imaging data. So we tried to see if we could duplicate uh, this uh, Brian Knudsen's data. And here we have about 130 individuals. And by the way, this is a very peculiar sample. So th this is based on both white Americans and some very tiny group of black Americans. Uh, in all the other analysis, we homogenized for the purpose of maximizing the effects. But in this case, no choice, because sample is small enough so that we needed to include everybody. Uh, and maybe that's a good thing. Uh, you know, uh, just uh, uh, we had to do it. And we used the same analysis. And, and we didn't replicate uh, Knudsen's result, no correlation at all. However, given our Japanese results, we had reason to suspect that some, somewhere here, control region of the brain might be related to neuroticism, even when total brain volume had nothing to do with neuroticism. And here's what we got. This is a whole brain analysis. And those regions are systematically associated with neuroticism in inverse direction. So more neurotic people show less brain volume in those regions. And here, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex again. <laughs> so uh, oh, yeah, here. This is, again, uh, effect is subtle, but this correlation is significant. 
so th this is only here. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. I'm very happy that you are doing something like this. Japanese results are here, right hand side, same region, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. As a function of neuroticism, this region seemed to increase among Japanese. Here, just a you know, contralateral side, opposite side, but same region, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Among American sample, this region seemed to decrease as a function of neuroticism. So obviously, this is very preliminary. I hope we can discuss a bit more. But I take this finding to be consistent with the notion that neuroticism can be adaptive as long as you exercise some self-regulatory effort, which we called adjustment in early work. But given this result, that could be a little bit more general. We don't know at this point. But uh, what's very interesting in, in the context of this cultural neuroscience seminar is that you know, neuroticism, presumably, that's kind of universal, at least cross-culturally common dispositional characteristics. Now, does this have any inherent effect on your biological health? No, you really have to take cultural context into account before making systematic prediction. And I, I, just I found your you know, pathway analysis seems very intriguing, so I, I want to learn a bit more later. Now, let me move on uh, to conscientiousness. Uh, I have uh, 20 minutes? Okay. Conscientiousness. Uh, and again, this is very, very interesting story, at least in my mind. Uh, what is conscientiousness? Uh, that's a global trait related to diligence, industrialness, indus industriousness and persistence, responsibility. Uh, those are kind of terms, synonyms of those are being used to measure this personality trait. And again, you have to start with the assumption that there's a systematic pattern of behaviors which you try to measure with those things. Okay, otherwise this seems like a joke. You know, those four words or something uh, could mean anything beyond those words, uh, which kind of, ad I, I did have that kind of attitude. I didn't believe this whole research, but, but now just to switch your perspective, there's something real behind those things, uh, and then data begin to emerge in some intriguing way. So again, here, Howard Friedman, uh, authoritative review. Uh, here's what he says. Perhaps the most exciting recent discovery to emerge in the area of personality, well-being, and health is the lifelong importance of conscientiousness. Did you know that? You know, you have to be conscientious to make it to graduate school. Um, individuals who are conscientious, that is prudent, dependable, well-organized, and persistent, stay healthier, thrive, and live longer. And that is true. Conscientiousness is a very good predictor of longevity. And conscientiousness, in this case, is a very good predictor of self-report health as well as biological health among humanity, as represented by Westerners, right? All right. Now, look at this. Do you know who this is? Oh, I'm sure you are not. Uh, here, Miwa. Miwa Sado. Sado is a family name. Miwa is the first name. Uh, she was a journalist uh, for NHK. That's a national broadcast station uh, in Japan. And very sadly, she was found dead in her Tokyo house. Uh, this is already a few years ago. And what is that? Well, basically, that's a congestive heart failure, some high, you know, cardiovascular problem. And as it turned out, she worked so hard. Uh, her overtime uh, approached 160 hours uh, in one month preceding her death. 160 hours, can you believe? Uh, you end up working eight hours more or even more. 
on every working day. And Karoshi uh, became a very, very, I don't know, uh, sensational uh, term in Japan in the recent years because in one estimate, every year about 200 people or more die for this reason. That's just amazing. Uh, and of course, once you have one death, there are lots of problems uh, behind it. Uh, and so anyway, so karoshi is very common in Japan. And also, as it turned out, it's very common in East Asian countries, including China and uh, uh, Korea, for sure. Taiwan, I don't know, but probably it's common. Now, is she conscientious? She is. You know, she's extremely conscientious. She is responsible. She is dutiful. She is persistent. So much so, so that she end up working so hard to the detriment of her well-being. So we wanted to use Midas Media sample to test some uh, analysis about conscientiousness. You know, conscientiousness may increase you know, conformity or, part, uh, you know, obligation or some uh, norm avoidance, you know, motivate norm congruous behavior. However, norms vary uh, systematically across different ethnic groups, cultural groups, so that if the norm emphasizes individual well-being, that's fine. You know, your soul is in your body. You really have to take care of yourself. That's one, you know, important message of individualism. You have to take care of yourself. Otherwise, God may not help you in the end. Okay? So that's one cultural context. Another cultural context really put lots of privilege, priority on social well-being, social welfare, uh, social well-being. So collective duty, collective obligation, and individual well-being, that could be important. But that's secondary, relatively speaking, to collective societal well-being. Now, why don't you imagine that you are extremely conscientious in one culture? Well, you are dutifully go to gym. You are dutifully have enough sleep. You are dutifully doing X and Y just to maintain your body. Of course, you become healthier, probably. That's what we know from the current literature. However, if you happen to find yourself in a duty-oriented cultural context. Not necessarily, you know, uh, again, it's an interesting question. Uh, is that cognitive or social structural? I would say both. You know, simply social institutional norms are constructed in such a way that there's a almost a forceful obligation to social duties. Uh, in many companies uh, in Japan, China, and so on. And maybe it's important that we are testing uh, real adult here because uh, college life is something else. You know, uh, you can skip classes, but not anymore after graduation. So here's a fairly straightforward idea. Uh, you know, uh, personal well-being uh, may be valued in one type of culture. And here, conscientious people, just are very conscientious about uh, avoiding bad behavior like this, or maybe going to gym or doing something healthy. And that leads to one health consequence. However, in other cultural contexts, like in Japan, uh, social well-being is valued far more and so clear priority is placed on personal, or clear priority is placed on collective welfare over personal welfare, so you end up working too hard. You end up working too hard, and conscientiousness can be, you know, really uh, toxic uh, in that context. 
so we wanted to see if there might be any evidence. And according to this you know, hypothesis, this woman uh, may be a victim of this cultural uh, system. So again, uh, we measured uh, conscientiousness uh, with those small number of items. Uh, you know, I hope I used the real lengthy scale, but this is all we have in big survey like this. And here's a straightforward uh, effect of conscientiousness on biological health risk. So up, bad, down, good. And what you see is that among American group, uh, MIDAS, uh, we replicated the previous research showing very strong effect of conscientiousness on health so that health improves, become better uh, as a function of conscientiousness. Among Japanese, if anything, uh, just the opposite. Just the opposite was the case. In this research, we could identify some potential mediators. You know, basically we had lots of uh, health-related items so that we could measure the extent to which you avoid smoking, you avoid alcohol consumption, you avoid bad sleeping patterns, and so on. So we had a measure of uh, avoidance of bad health, unhealthy behaviors. Now, conscientious Americans may, may do this kind of avoidance more, and would that explain this inverse relationship between conscientiousness and uh, health? And here's a, uh, this is a health, health compromising behaviors, smoking, alcohol consumption, bad sleeping pattern, and here's conscientiousness. You know, uh, uh, more conscientious Americans, oh, wait a minute, this is opposite, I'm sorry. Can this be true? Yeah, I, I see, this is a health compromising behavior. So health compromising behavior become less as a function of conscientious, conscientiousness among Americans, but interestingly, Japanese didn't show anything like this. So clearly, uh, uh, you know, conscientiousness works in very different way in different socio-ecological conditions. So conscientiousness can make you healthier because conscientiousness uh, allow you to avoid bad behaviors and probably engage in healthy behaviors in cultural context where personal well-being is valued normatively. And this seems to account for this interesting correlation, association between conscientiousness and better health. How about Japanese? Well, here we have uh, those measures of social obligation, particularly family obligation and obligation to work. As it turned out, obligation to public and community had nothing to do with it. So we use those items to measure the extent of social obligation. So prediction is, is it true that conscientious people, conscientious people carry out more obligation? More obligation you do, you become less healthy. Is this particularly true among Japanese as compared to European Americans? As it turned out, the answer to it is the complicated complicated, uh, well, first of all, conscientiousness predicted social obligation in both cultures. That kind of makes sense. You know, if you are conscientious, you try to do good things. You know, taking care of your kids, or taking care of your spouse, or doing good thing uh, for your university department, or maybe, you know, do something else, social duties, that's what you do. However, this is the effect of obligation on health. What's going on is that more obligation you do, 
that seem to compromise health among Japanese, meaning that presumably you are overdoing social obligation. Among Americans, well, here I think uh, all the research by John Miller, do you know who John Miller is? John is a, one of the pioneers in cultural psychology. She worked with Rick Schwader in India. And her major point was that social obligation is seen as a moral duty among Indians, whereas social obligation is seen as a personal choice among Americans. So if it's a personal choice, you know, obligation is a good thing. You choose to do it. However, you can always choose not to do it if you don't want to. One social obligation begins to compromise your health. So anyway, so that's our current interpretation. And uh, given this data, it's obvious. This mediation, you know, conscientiousness leads to social obligation, which in turn compromise your health, did work out very nicely. Very nicely, I mean, that's a little bad expression, you know, just uh, extra commitment, excessive commitment to science. And that sad story, illuminating dark side uh, of Japanese culture, I have to say. Uh, however, uh, I mean, uh, statistically speaking, that mediation seemed to work out. Among Americans, conscientiousness leads to more obligation, but it didn't have much effect at all on biological health. So. So anyway, uh, so I, let me wrap this up. Um, this uh, line of research is uh, very recent and very preliminary at this point. But I found all this very, very interesting. Uh, for one thing, uh, uh, this peer of research may begin to challenge uh, what's taken for granted uh, in, in the current field. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, clearly Friedman and Kahn had in mind human, humanity in mind when they make those statements. And so neuroticism is bad, conscientiousness is good for your health, but th this you know, those statements depend entirely on subject populations. And uh, so uh, I hope that our initial research begin to eliminate the limitation of the current literature uh, and also hopefully begin to shed some light on why uh, cultural differences might exist when they do uh, manifest themselves. Uh, so, in terms of conclusion, um, clearly biological health is very distinct from uh, subjective health. And I completely agree with Carol that time is very ripe and extremely exciting to bring biology in into cultural research. And one really important message that's coming out of this is that Biology appears to respond to threat. Clearly, uh, I'm influenced by uh, Steve Cole. Uh, but, well, basically threat. That's uh, anticipated the injury on your soul. And as I mentioned to you, this inflammation system get activated when the system anticipate some injury to your system. You know, originally, it's a physical body. But now we are sophisticated enough so that this body is replaced by or added uh, to, to an added symbolic soul, symbolic self. Now, something like, uh, you know, this morning, it's just I was thinking that uh, you showed some very interesting data um, about, oh, I forgot, I I'm sorry. Uh, this is such an impolite thing to say, I forgot. Uh, but one thing uh, I was thinking about, something like effects of negative affect, negative emotion, 
on biological health. Well, this is related to neuroticism. But when you measure uh, you know, daily affect experience every day, maybe taking diary or some you know, uh, experience sampling study, and if you experience lots of negative emotion, like disgust, anger, yeah, you talked about this, something like this. When you assess subjective report of negative affect, that does predict flattened cortisol slope. That's a bad sign. Uh, that's a bad sign of stress. And also, negative affect predict greater inflammation, like uh, IL-6. That's true only in Americans. As it turned out, Japanese do not seem to care. Just the effect is entirely flat. Now, we don't know exactly why, but one speculation is that this emphasis on positive affect and also emphasis on self-regulation you know, you have to be happy. Pursuit of happiness is a great moral virtue. And you have to help yourself so that you have to seek positive affect. So that's one cultural context. Then imagine that you end up experiencing lots of guilt, anger, blah, blah, blah. That's threatening. That's a threat. Because that can indicate inadequacy of the self. It's just, uh, you know, you are incompetent. And that can be extremely strong threat to which your biological system can respond. You know, you might imagine that in a culture that emphasizes in and the end, where bad things can happen, because they do. But they can go, and they can be the beginning of something better to occur if you wait long enough. That's an entirely different thing. And so this threat experience may be much more among you know, residents of those cultures where controlling emotion, experience positive emotion, is culturally sanctioned and entertained and propagated in media and possibly textbooks and so on, which may not be true in many other cultural contexts. And probably there are many other things like this. And I think just to conclude, uh, I, I hope it's very clear that this whole research field needs to be expanded beyond weird samples. By weird, uh, do you know what this is? Uh, Western, educated, industrialized, uh, rich, democratic samples. Um, so really, this is uh, important. And personality, uh, you know, those are globally universal. That is, when you measure personality, something like this, uh, those are very common. But exactly how they are integrated or combined to or paired with uh, daily life seem to, seem to depend entirely on local cultural environment. And health and well-being, I think one important message uh, my research has nothing to do with uh, is that typically, you know, in this kind of literature, health and well-being is usually used as an ultimate uh, outcome variable. Uh, I, I think that's not quite right. Uh, you know, health and well-being uh, is a part of the story, much larger dynamic story of cultural adaptation, uh, where you know sometimes you have to torture your body uh, so as to maintain subjective well-being. Some other times you have to compromise subjective well-beings to stay afloat. And this whole dynamic, which is kind of socio-ecological system, needs to be described and analyzed uh, to make advancement uh, in this literature, I think. So thank you so much.